of two particles using the same reasoning, p square can you, you can show that p square can never be less than zero. So we will assume that p i the total initial or momentum squared of my particles is greater than zero. What will that give me? If I go from one reference plane to the other reference plane, the components of four vectors, they, they will always change. But there are certain invariants, like the square of a four vector. Square of a four vector can never change. It's an invariant. So if it is positive in one reference plane, it has to be positive in all other reference planes. You can actually show that if a, a p squared is larger than zero, you can always find the reference frame in which this is equal to p i zero and zero. Essentially, it, in a sense, if it was the four momentum of a single particle, this just tells you that you can go to its stretch plane. If p squared was equal to zero, then I couldn't do this. Or p squared was less than zero, I again couldn't do this. Because if in one reference plane p can be written in this form, it means p squared is greater than zero in all the reference planes, not just a single one. So this is the reference frame that I will be uh, use, using, studying my system. Now, I have these four Dirac deltas. Three of them are the momentum, face the momentum conservation, and the fourth one says the energy con conservation. Using the three of the Dirac deltas, I can just calculate this integral. And then ds d sigma will be m squared over m, 2 pi to the 4. There will be just one left, pi 0 minus d1 minus d2. d cubed, let's, let's evaluate this in two integrals. d cubed p2 divided by 2 pi cubed. 2 pi to the 6, I have two of them. 4, e1, e2. Now, from now on, wherever I, of course, this m can depend on p2. What, what I have with this amplitude. In principle, it can depend on p2. But after this step, wherever I see a p2 in this expression, I will just set p2 is equal to minus p1. So choosing this capital P equal to this, uh, this form in this form is equivalent to going to the center of mass frame of the final two particles. I still have one more Dirac delta appearing over there. I didn't use it anywhere yet. My convention will be 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus. But up to now, I didn't use it. Except then, p squared is equal. Yeah, I did. I did. So let's see. There is one more Dirac delta appearing over here, which I can use this Dirac delta to calculate one of these integrals. Now, in, if you remember what this d1 is. d1 is square root of, oh, this is d1. d1 squared plus m1 squared. d2 is square root of d2 squared plus m2 squared. But I know that d2 is minus d1. So this is d1 squared plus m2 squared. This is my e2. Now here, almost everything depends. It doesn't depend on the direction of p1, but only on the orientation of p1. Only on the magnitude of p1, sorry. So let's make the same assumption about the m squared also. If m squared doesn't depend on the orientation of 
g1, but only on this magnitude of g1, I can just say d cube g1 is equal to d1 squared dp1. Okay, these are just the three squares, the three components, the space components. These are not four vector squares. Times the direction of g1. So d sigma by d omega my differential process for for a scattering in which the fi in the final state I only have two particles is equal to m squared divided by m 1 over 2 pi squared for d1 e2 I have the Dirac delta d1 0 minus square root of d1, that is capital D1, d1 squared plus m1 squared minus square root of d1 squared plus m2 squared d cubed d1 squared dp1 So this is, I need to evaluate over P1. This is an expression, a function in the direct data, I have just a function of P1. So I know how to take this integral. This will be equal to m squared over m, what over 16 pi squared D1 e2, D1 squared 1 over I need to take the derivative of this expression with respect to p1, and it will give me p1 over square root of d1 squared plus m1 squared. If d1 squared plus now this is nothing but e1. Remember, this is my e1, and this is my so I can multiply E1 and E2. M squared over M. 1 over 16 pi squared. So I have E1, P1. They will just cancel one of these. So I have P1 over, if I multiply these, I get E1, E2 over E1 is just E2. E1, E2 over E2 is just E1. So here I have E1 plus E2. Of course, this E1 and E2, they both depend on P1. And But P1 is nothing but, instead of P1 appearing here, I have to put the solution of this expression. But if I put the solution of this expression, this is E1, this is E2, the solution of this expression just makes E1 plus E2 is equal to P1, 0. So the sigma over the omega, the differential cross-section is m squared, my invariant matrix element squared, 1 over 16 pi squared, I have this factor 1 over m, this factor appearing over here, e1 plus e2 is nothing but this p1 0 appearing over here, p1 over p1 0. Now I can change my notation slightly, remember if this is my, if I imagine two particles colliding, this is the total center of mass, energy, momentum. S, the Mandelstam variable S is nothing but Pi squared, but Pi squared is just Pi zero squared. So Pi zero is nothing but square root of S. is 
this is a binary differential short circuit. Follow through by this cathode. Now we came and just said five minutes. Let's okay. In the meanwhile, we made some assumptions. We said that we we don't yet know what this m is, but we assume that it only depends on the magnitude of the initial particle momentum. Let's see under what conditions it can be valid. Now, if we assume that we are colliding two scalar particles, so what are scalars? They don't have any spin. They don't have any orientation information. So, moreover, let's just take the process to be elastic. In the center of mass frame, what will happen? The particle will just come, and they will scatter. So, We have two incoming particles and two outgoing particles. This is my data, the scattering angle. So everything appears in a plane. But we know that the laws of nature are uh, symmetric under rotation. So there is nothing that dictates us how we should orient this plane. If the initial particles are scalar or if the beams are unpolarized and we are coming over all the possible polarizations in the final state. So that we can Really, if we rotate this plane, but by rotating this plane, what I mean is, instead of choosing, let's say, the x-axis like that, y-axis like that, z-axis in that direction, I can just choose my x-axis like that, y-axis like that, z-axis in the other direction. Nothing should change. That's just my choice. Nature doesn't really care about that. If I make this change, the orientation of the momenta will change. So. No physical, since nothing should change if I just change my, uh, no physical observable should change as I change my coordinate axis. Nothing should depend on the orientation of my moment. But what, uh, what this m squared can depend on is this angle theta. Because independent of how I choose my uh, coordinate axis, this theta will always have the same value. More or less, more, moreover, the, let's say the momenta squared, any four momenta squared, you have the same value, but this momentum squared is nothing but the mass squared. I am fixing the energy. If I am assuming that the particles are also, the, the collision is elastic, in that case, the magnitude of the initial particle momentum and the final particle momentum will also change. So the only thing, only physical quantity to which this m squared can depend is this angle theta over here. Now, how can this be more complicated? For example, if we assume that the, our beam has some, is polarized, we create a polarized electron beam or a polarized photon beam. In that case, we have another preferred direction. Now, this theta is basically, since when we collide the particles, we are creating a preferred direction, which is this direction. If we put a spin, we create another another preferred direction, which is this direction. So the process becomes much more complicated. So this m squared over here can have a much more complicated structure, much more complicated dependence on this momentum. So I think it's over for the time. Any questions up to now? Now, tomorrow, up to now, we just ignored what this m squared is. Tomorrow, we will start by what happens if this, let's say, this m in general can depend on p1 and p2. It can contain a term like p1 mu, one component of this four vector. In that case, how do we calculate this equation? We will study that and then go on how to calculate this m explicitly in a given theory. This s over here. Well, there are just three variables that we usually de define. Let's say in this process, we have the p1, p2, the initial momenta. They scatter k1, k2. Usually, we prefer to, well, 
phenomenologists, experiment theorists, prefer to express their result in terms of quantities that will not change from one reference frame to the other reference frame. So this, these are quite commonly used variables called the Mandelstam variables. is the square of the sum of the initial particle four momenta. There is also T, this is T1 minus K1 squared, and U is T1 minus T2 squared. They are just ways to parameterize our expression. S is also equal to the four times the center of mass energy. 